Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. No matter what, we, what is going on, you gave us a beautiful day today. And Lord, we just thank you that we can all assemble here in our comfortable building. And Lord, we look for your word this evening to be delivered through Scott. And we are just praying to have our hearts softened and opened and just hear and receive your word and your will. And Lord, we say this. We honor you, we worship you, and we love you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Well, good evening. How are we all doing? All right. I'm going to get in the Word this evening. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's John. Raise your hand. He'll get you a Bible. And... Uh, we going to follow along. We all got Bibles. All right, that's a good sign. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and uh, let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come before you, and Lord, we can never get enough of your word. We always need to grow. Help us not just to maintain, but help us to move forward. Growing. And we just pray for this evening that you get honored, that you get glorified, and it's all about you, what you did for us. We can never thank you enough of all the things that we have. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. So we are in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, okay? <laughs> there we go, I got it. <laughs> Well, let me give you a little backdrop, okay? And uh, I like to do that, and uh, this is a great epistle, as they all are. I always say that, you know, every time I get up here, and it's got so much to say to us, you know? And, uh, you know, the purpose was to warn believers about false doctrine and to exhort them to grow in their faith in the knowledge of Christ. And, you know, I've said it before and said again, you know, the Bible says, if, 2 John 1, 9, if you don't abide in the doctrines of Christ, you don't have God. If you abide in the doctrines of Christ, you have the Father and the Son. There's a lot of different Jesus that's going on in the landscape. You know, I look at the Jehovah Witnesses, and uh, why do I bring this up? Well, to me, it's very relevant. And, you know, there's a lot of churches that don't hit on these subjects. But if you want to protect the flock and you want to warn the flock, then you've got to speak truth. And so... If I look at Jehovah Witness Jesus and I compare it to the Bible, uh, their Jesus, they say that he's Michael the Archangel. Uh, they say he's not God. He didn't rise bodily from the dead. He rose in spirit. That's a different Jesus. I take the Jesus of Mormonism and I look at them, that Jesus. They say Jesus was created. He's one God amongst many gods. They say he was created when he's not because Jesus is from everlasting to everlasting. No beginning and no end. So he wasn't created. They say he's a spirit brother Lucifer. No, he was not. Lucifer was created. Cannot be. That's a different Jesus. Then I take the Jesus of Islam. 1.7 billion strong. That's a lot of people. And they say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He's not God that Jesus pointed the way to Muhammad, he wasn't the way. And Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. He is God. Then I look at the Jesus of the New Age movement. Boy, I tell you what, if you go into your bookstores, uh, you're going to see the bookstores just loaded with New Age. But there's nothing new under the sun. The New Age Jesus, they say that he is an ascended master through a cultic and metaphysical disciplines. That's a different Jesus. If you don't have the right Jesus, you don't have God. Right. If you don't have the right Jesus, you're not going to heaven. So it's important that you know the real Jesus. And you know what salvation is. You know, Jesus said, and when Jesus speaks, we need to listen. If you read Matthew 24, it's an incredible chapter. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said, in the last days, there'll be false Christ." and false prophets, showing great signs and wonders that if it be possible, even the very elect will be deceived.
And there's a lot of deception. A lot of deception. But Jesus said this. He says, if you continue in my word, then indeed you are in my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. And so the author here is Peter, of course, and uh, to whom it was written, it was written to the church at large, and we're the church right here, right? right? Where two or three are gathered together in the midst, there is he, the ecclesia, or the called out ones. Peter knew that his time is limited on earth. And we're not going to get into verse 14, but we'll do that next week, God willing. But Peter talks about he must put off this tent. And we're kind of like a tent, aren't we? And you put the tent on the ground, and then the tent you know, gets folded back up, and you put it away, right? But our life is very short as far as eternity. You know, it goes very fast, and it goes very quickly. But Peter will be talking about he's going to lay his life down for the faith. And... Um, so he's warning believers what's in his heart. What is in his heart? And uh, what's going to happen when he leaves? You know, Paul says this, that in the last, he says, I know, he says this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. And Satan's on a warpath. He comes to kill, he comes to rob, and he comes to destroy. And he hasn't, he hasn't changed an MO. He's still doing the same thing. He also reminds him, Peter also reminds us this, uh, of the unchanging truth of the gospel. The gospel doesn't change. You know, uh, Malachi 3, 6, it says, I, the Lord, change not. So we can have confidence in that word. And it also says there's no changing or variableness or shadow of turning in, the, in God's word. Let us go to Proverbs 30, and let's look at Proverbs 30, verse 5. Let's turn into our Bibles, Proverbs 30, verse 5, okay? Let's check that out. We're going to be going through the Bible. Uh, keep your marker in Peter, by the way, okay? Because we're going to continue to visit back, go back to that text. So Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, and here's what it says. Now wait till we all get there. It says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, and let's look at verse 2. Deuteronomy 4, 2. And here's what it says. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. It says this. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So two times we have it there, don't we? Now let's go, let's fast forward. Let's go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelations 22, 18, and 19. Let's look at that. That's an easy book to find, the first and the last book, right? All right. So here's what it says. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. It says this, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of the book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Very serious when you add to the word of God, when you take away from the word of God. You're not in a good place, and you can miss heaven. And I'll tell you what, many of the cults have done that. They've added and they've taken away. I don't have a time to get into all the specifics on that, but you know, as far as the, the LDS Church, they have the original 1830 Book of Mormon, and then you fast forward to the current Book of Mormon, and there's thousands of changes. Well, did we say that our God doesn't change? But see, their God progresses. Our God doesn't. So, 
It's important that you be that brand, that Acts 17, 11 brand, right? That you search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. You check it out. Make sure it lines up. All right, let's continue on. This epistle is a letter of warning from the courageous and faithful apostle of Christ. Soon after, he would die and be martyred for the faith. Now, previously in the, in the first epistle, um, in Peter, he had written to comfort and exhort, encourage the believers in the midst of suffering and persecution. That was the first epistle. Just three years later, in the second epistle, he wrote to warn them of an internal attack, the complacency and heresy. And so, you know, really, the, you know, we talk about the church being attacked on the outside, but the church gets attacked on the inside. You know, I heard it been said, you know, um, <laughs> that Satan goes to bed early Saturday night to wake up early Sunday morning to go to church. And I can tell you this, man, that sometimes the biggest warfare is when Sunday comes along. Because Satan hates when the brethren get together in unity. And he is doing all he can to try to break us up. But you know, we stay together. We stay together, and with God before us, who can be against us? And so, you know, it's really incumbent to all of us. When we come to church, let's not just read the word one day a week, but let's read the word every day of the week. Just like that daily manna, that food that we got to get, right, to get spiritual nourishment. You know, there's no shortcut to our, our, Christi our Christian faith. It takes time to spend time with the Lord. Je like I said, Jesus said, if you continue, then you're my disciples and you know the truth and the truth will set you free. So it's that continuing of the word of God. Now let's get into the verse, uh, verse one, okay? Just that's a little backdrop. Now let's, let's go upon line upon line and precept upon precept. So Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Simon's name was given to him at birth, but Peter means rock, is the name the Lord gave him. Simon was a man of weakness, but now Simon is a man of strength. Okay? He's a man of strength. You know, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not come against it. Thou art Peter upon this rock. Who, who is he talking about, that rock? It's not Peter. Peter's the Petros. He's the small pebble. Jesus is talking about the Petros, the chief cornerstone. So the church was built upon Jesus. And the gates of hell won't come against the church. You know, amen. So Peter describes himself as a servant, a doulos, a slave. It was by choice. And he was an apostle by divine assignment. And it's, a, it's one sent with a commission. Peter identifies himself as the authoritative uh, spokesman for the truth that Christ proclaimed. So he was appointed. He was a divine appointment that Peter was to give out with a commission of the word, okay? Now prior, uh, Peter identifies himself as an authoritative sports, uh, excuse me, spokesman for the truth that Christ proclaimed. In 1 Peter, I'm sorry, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 4, Peter describes the resources his readers have that will make growth in grace and knowledge possible. So let's read that first, that first verse. Let's read it all the way down. Here's what it says. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So like precious faith. You know, we're saved by faith in the old and we're saved by faith in the new, right? It doesn't change, okay? Anyone who has faith in God, we have access to God, don't we? And we have access 24-7, 365. I don't need to make an appointment. God's ear is always open to the cries of his people. And I'm so thankful that I don't have to make an appointment. He's there. I can be driving in my car. I can be sleeping uh, dead of the world. I can be at work. I can be at church. I can be anywhere. And I have access to God, 365, 24-7. Amen. Now, the righteousness, the justification is real time. So the righteousness of Christ, how do we get that? It's through repentance. 
giving Christ our sin, then he gives us his righteousness. Okay? And that's the relationship that we get into. That's not a religion, but that relationship. And when we become born again, and we become right with God, we become saved, it doesn't happen over a long period of time. It's instant. Right? Now, the sanctification is that lifelong process. And sometimes that sanctification, uh, it kind of hurts, doesn't it? But God is working on us. And he's working on us. He puts us on that wheel and he molds us and shapes us. And uh, what a beautiful thing. But that righteousness of Christ, we can't get saved by works. We can't earn our salvation. We can't, we can't do and do and do and do to become right. He did all the work on the cross. He said, it's finished. He said, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and renewing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus did the work, and that's a beautiful thing. And notice here in that verse 1, look, look, here's what it says. In that last sentence in that verse 1, it says, the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to me, that tells me Jesus is God, right? right? Jesus is Savior, and he's God. How many times has somebody said, you know, show me a scripture where Jesus is God? Well, we got one right there. And, you know, there's hundreds, hundreds in the old, hundreds. You know, there's, there's so many scriptures on the deity of Christ. It's all through the Bible, the 66 books. How do you miss it? You miss it because your heart is hard. The natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. But you know what? God can penetrate. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. God can take away that fog. You know? And so we just, we're, we're just a, a messenger getting out the mail, aren't we? We have a message, and we get, the, we get the message to people, and we lay it to them, and we give it to them, and they can do what they want. They can yield or not yield. They can harden or they can be soft. But Jesus is God. What, what about that John 1.1? 1, 1? You know what John 1.1 1, 1 says? There you go. John 1.1. 1, 1. Beautiful verse. That's a very powerful scripture on the deity of Christ. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. Now let's go to verse 2. To those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God our Savior, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here's the thing. How can these blessings be multiplied? Not addition, but multiplication. How can they be multiplied? The more you love God, the more you know God, the more you're going to love God. You can't exhaust God. You know, growing in the wisdom and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The more you know God, the more you know Jesus Christ. Okay? And how do you add? That's how you add. It's the knowledge of Christ, our Lord. And the, the thing is this, is when you do that, he gives you that peace, doesn't he? He gives you that peace that passes all understanding, Right? And I can tell you this, you know, the way that we can get peace is to get into God's sanctuary. Get into the Holy of Holies. You know, Psalm 91, it's a great, uh, great chapter, 16 verses in that. And that first part of Psalm 91, it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. And my God in him will I trust. Wow, I'll tell you what. When you get into that sanctuary and you get settled in your spirit and God shows up and gives you that peace, you can't put a price tag on that. You know, the world's looking for peace in all the wrong places. But there is no peace. But with Jesus Christ, he is the, he is the prince of peace. And so when we spend time in the word, when we spend time in fellowship, then he gives us what we need. And we're not lacking. He gives us what we need. Amen. Let's continue on. Now look at this great verse here, verse 3. 
it says, as his divine power has given to us some things. So the word all means all, right? <laughs> all right. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And so God has made full provision for us in this life of holiness. We, we're not lacking. He has everything he's given us, right? It says that my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Not necessarily all our wants. He, he supplies all our needs. He gives us all that we need in this life. Philippians 3.10. Let's go to Philippians 3.10. You're going to get blessed in this verse. Philippians 3.10. Let's go there. Philippians 3.10. Here's what it says. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Wow. That's an incredible scripture. The power of his resurrection and the same spirit that dwells in Jesus dwells in us, doesn't it? So we got that power that God's given us. And what does Philippians 4.13 say, guys? I can do all things through who? Who strengthens me? All things. There's that power. And the power is the resource for God to live in, to be holy as he is holy. You know, have you ever had a conversation with someone and, you know, you're talking to them and... The conversation's going back and forth, and God just seems to supernaturally give you something to say to that individual. And you're talking, and it's, it's not really you, it's but God working through you to them. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. When you step out in faith, you step out of your bubble and your comfort zone, you step on the water, so to speak, and you start sharing your faith, God is going to bring people in your life, and he's going to speak through you, to bless other people. And you're going to have that conversation, and you're going to say, you're, and then you're going to reflect on it when it's over, and you can say, man, you know, that wasn't me, that was God. God gave you that power, that resurrection power, and he showed up. The most exciting life is the Christian life, bar none. It, it's, it, it's exciting. And you know, when we start stepping out in faith and start, you know, letting God open the doors, and we go through those doors, our faith grows, our walk gets stronger, and God uses you more. He's not looking for people. He's not looking for perfect people, okay? All he's looking for is people that are available. That's it. That's it. Be available. Ordinary people. Amen. But in Acts 1.8, okay, it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's that, it's that dutimous power that God comes down upon you that he gives. Now let me ask you a question. When we receive Christ, do you get 10% of the Holy Spirit? Do you get 99% of the Holy Spirit? The word all means all, 100%, right? So if you're a child of God, you have 100% of the Holy Spirit. And when I see the Bible, it says God's not a respecter person. You say, I can't do that. I know you can't do that. But with God, you can do all things are possible. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that's glorious. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Now, looking at that verse 3, it says, who called us by glory and virtue. So that call to us glory means to be Christ-like, to be like Christ. And that virtue has to do with, uh, with excellence, courage. In other words, don't cut and run. Sometimes you stand up to the battle, you fight the good fight of faith. It's so easy to cut and run and to get out of dodge. But, you know, God says, you know what, stay there and face that opposition, you know, fight the battle. You know, we're soldiers, right? And if we're soldiers, we got to put the armor on. You know what the armor is. It's a, you know, it's, it's the helmet. 
It's the sword, it's the shield, the breastplate, the feast shot with the preparation of the gospel, and the, and, and the, and the going out and walking this out, getting dressed for battle. Matter of fact, let's, you're going to get blessed. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to point a, um, a verse out here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, let's check it out. Um, and this is what the very first thing we should do, okay? So Ephesians chapter 6, let's camp there for a little bit. And so you have, you know, 10 through 16 and 17, and it talks about the armor that I mentioned, the helmet, the sword, and all the, everything else. But look at verse 18. Have you noticed verse 18? And here's what it says. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So you got the armor and you put it on, but it doesn't leave out prayer, does it? You put that prayer behind it, and that's where the power is. You know, before you go out to the battle and do anything, you pray. You know, we talk a lot about reading the Word, but I'll tell you what, prayer is powerful, right? And I'll tell you what, if Jesus prayed, how much more should we pray? <clears throat> Jesus is God. And he got up early in the morning. And he prayed. He communed with the Father. He said, I and my Father are one. And he had fellowship with his Father. And so, if we're going to be a strong Christian, you've got to have them both. You've got to be in the Word, and you've got to pray and have fellowship with God. Amen. Praise God. So, again, that virtue is, is, is strong. You'll be strong in the Lord with the power, that power of the resurrection and fight that good fight. And I'll tell you what, the world is really coming against us in its in full barrels, isn't it? It wants to marginalize our message. It wants to water the gospel down. It wants us to be quiet. And they're going to push their, you know, if they're out there pushing their narrative and they don't have the truth, we need to be out pushing our narrative because we got the truth. You know, I, tell, I, say, I say this, you know, I, I remember Walter Martin said, or, uh, he said this back in the day, and he said, are we, are we willing to do for the truth what the cults do for the lie? Man, I'm telling you, they have a false gospel, and we got a true gospel, and you know what? We have an opportunity, but the window is shutting. But I'll tell you what, let's press on. What, what's the Bible, what Paul says, I press on to the mark of the high calling and the prize of Jesus Christ. Let's press on. Let's not be ashamed. Amen. Let's go to verse 4. Amen, yeah, amen to that. So it says in verse 4, it says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So great and precious promises refers to numerous offers that God gives us, his divine provisions. God gives us so many promises in the Bible. I mean, there's thousands. And in those promises are yea and amen. Okay? And you know, he keeps his promises. You know, uh, not so much for us. You know, we can promise things and, you know, we got feet of clay and, you know, we're going to fall short. But God's never going to fall short. Put confidence that when he says something, he's going to do it. Amen. But what are some of these promises? I mean, my gosh, we could be here for a month of Sundays given so many. I'll just give you a few. Um, okay, John 6, 37. He that comes to me, I will no wise cast out. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take upon my yoke and learn of me. It gives you rest. Okay? Well, we know, John, we know uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? And how about this? 1 Corinthians 10.13. There has no temptation taken you such as common to man. But God is faithful and just with the temptation that he's made a way for you to escape, that you can bear it. So with every temptation that comes your way, God says he's given you a way to escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He's given you a escape door. 
to get out of Dodge. Remember the story between uh, Joseph and Potiphar? And Potiphar's wife? Well, she was trying to put eyes on him and wanted to have relations with Joseph. And, you know, um, what did Joseph do? Yeah, he, he, he did the 180 and he took out. He fled. And so when you have a temptation coming on, you get out of Dodge, you get out of town, and you run. And God's given you the ability to do that. Okay? Oh, let's go, to, let's go to Isaiah 40. Let's look at the last verse in Isaiah 40. You want to be blessed? Let's go to Isaiah 40, 31. Let's check it out. Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 31. I know you've heard this, but it's, it's so fresh. It never gets stale. The, the Word of God is alive. It's sharp. It's powerful. Isaiah 40, 31. God's promise here. It says this, But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many of you today needed that verse today? All of our hands should go up, right? I think we need that verse 365, 24-7, <laughs> right? Right? Because sometimes we just get weary and we get tired. But God says he's going to mount us up as wings of eagles and we shall get our strength renewed. And you know, the word of God is sharp and it's fresh, it's powerful, and it's very comforting. There's so many. I mean, like I said, we just gave a few and we could spend so much more time in that. But you know, go through the Bible and, and get blessed by the promises that he gives you. You know? Um, and so I thought that would be encouraging to, to bring that out. Amen. Let's go back to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's take it to verse 5 and 7. Take it down, okay? All right. <clears throat> it says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Wow. There's a lot of good things there, right? In these verses, here's the thing. Have you progressed or are you just maintaining? Let me say that again. In these verses, have you progressed or are you just maintaining? Holding the line. I hope not we're just holding the line. I hope that we're going forward. We're progressing in those things of God. Okay? He wants us to grow spiritually. You know, I mean, we can only be in the sandbox for so long, right? And we got to get out of the sandbox. And we got we to gotta grow up and get mature. Okay? And you know, we're doing that tonight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Our faith, we're exercising our spiritual muscle. And we're getting stronger, right? And Jesus said this. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus is the water of the word. And I need bread and I need water. And he gives me those both things. And so the word is the bread. And it feeds our soul, right? Amen to that. It feeds our soul. Amen. But you know what? Here's the thing, guys. You know, the Bible says, don't just be a hearer of the word but be a doer. We can sit here and we can learn these great truths of God and say amen and, you know, all in him are amen and hallelujah, but the thing is, we've got to put application behind that, don't we? Because that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road, putting application by God, behind God's word. And that's what he wants us to do. And so we've got to study the word. We've got to know the word. We've got to live the word. Okay? There's no such thing as an instant breakfast Christian. <laughs> you know, I remember back in the day where, uh, you know, they had these, car uh, what is it, instant breakfast, carnation instant breakfast. And, you know, you used to rip it up and put it in milk and stir it up, you know, and drink it. And then you're out for the day, and you hope that carries you for eight hours, you know. But you know what? Uh, you need a little more than that, don't you? <laughs> and so you need that steady diet of the word, okay? You need that steady diet of prayer. 
communing with the Father, communing with the Son. Okay? You need that. Let's go to 2 Timothy uh, 2.15. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15. It ties in what I'm talking about here, what, what God's saying. Okay? And this is so important. 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, here it is, application. Here's what it says. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. To be diligent, okay? What we, what we talked about in verses 5 through 7, to be diligent. Now, let's go back to Peter. Go back to Peter. Let's look at some of these attributes that we have here in, in uh, verses 5 through 7. Okay? Knowledge. This emphasizes the importance of staying, uh, again, into the scriptures. And uh, how about temperance? How about self-control? Well, I tell you, we need self-control, don't we? You know, we could save a lot of heartache if we have more self-control. I'm telling you, you know, once one, it gets out of the mouth, you can't get those words back. You know, you're quick to draw and you shoot from the hip and you get the word out. And, oh, why did I say that? You know? And, you know, it's true. Be slow to speak and quick to hear. And you can save yourself a lot of heartache. Let me tell you. I, we're all shaking our heads and smiling. I, I guess you can relate to that, right? <laughs> Amen. Self-control, perseverance, endurance, running the race. We need to be constantly reminded that the Christian life, it has a lot of challenges. It really does. And to endure, it's not enough to stand and go in a blaze of glory. It has a lot of challenges. We must persevere in spite of difficulties, right? And you know, the idea of Christianity is, 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 is an unending round of mountaintop experiences is really unrealistic. You know, we have tremendous highs, but we don't stay up there, right? And then we got tremendous lows and that's how the Christian walk is it's, it's highs and it's lows and it, it's things in between and that's, that's life right uh, you know the daily routine the menial tasks of life that's it the disappointing circumstances the bitter grief the shattered plans you know we, we all experience that don't we we are in a journey in this life but even in spite of all that God's with us. God's with us. He doesn't leave us alone. And I'm thankful for that. God is so personal. You know, you look at the, there's 7 billion people on the planet. Maybe more, maybe 8, close to 8 billion. And you think you're just one, you know, tiny speck of protoplasm on the planet. But you know what? He knows you by name. And all his thoughts are as the sands towards you towards you, and towards me. God's personal. That's a whole lot of thoughts going towards me that God's thinking. God loves you so much he can't keep his eyes off you. And he died for you. And I'm just, it's so comforting. He just doesn't wind up the clock and just say, okay, let it run on its own. And, you know, no, he is very personal. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. But we have the highs, we have the lows, and everything in between. We just keep on plodding, plodding along. You know, stay the course, you know. Uh, keep going forward. Don't just maintain, but grow and add to your faith. Okay? Now, Satan attacks the mind, doesn't he? Boy, th th that's the minefield, right? The mind, you know. Idle's time is the devil's workshop, right? You know what the Bible tells about the mind? It says the renewing of the mind. Let, be not transformed this world, but be renewing of your mind. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, 1, 1 and 2. Let's check that out. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's check it out. Romans, um, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. All right. Well, we're going through a lot of books of the Bible tonight, aren't we? That's a good thing, huh? Now, so many churches will give you two or three scriptures and a lot of little sermonette. Uh, make me feel good and how to become a better you and you go out and it's like you know you got a cotton candy message it wasn't much substance to it it was sweet but it dissolved and it didn't it didn't sustain you 
But when you go through the Word of God, it sustains you. It equips you. But let's go to uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Here's what it says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, the mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need our minds renewed, don't we? Amen. And God is going to give us all that, all that we need to have that take place. But we've got to spend time with him. Okay? Now let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at these great characteristics here. Um, in verse 7, you have brotherly kindness. And it identifies us to, to the world as Christ's disciples. Kindness. What, what did Jesus say? He said, by this all men shall know you if you have love for one another. And really love is, is something that it's really, it has to come from the spirit. It can't be something that you just try to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and try to love people. Jesus wants us to love people as he loves people. And I'll tell you what, it's impossible. But you know, with God, we can do it. We can do it. With God, all things, with men, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That love that comes from us, that kindness. You know, I think you're going to attract a lot more people when you're kind than being stern and harsh and angry all the time. Have you met people like that? You know, I don't, go, I don't make a beeline to, to go out of my way to be with them. Um, but, you know, even in spite of that, we still need to love the unlovable, don't we? Maybe God is saying, hey, that's a mission field for you. It's easy to love people that love back, but it's much harder to love people that are unlovable. And you know what? That's, God wants us to reach those people. And we can. It's an opportunity. But let's be kind. Charity. Love, you know, that volitional love, okay? Now, here's the thing. In, in verse 8, let's check verse 8 out, and here's what it says. It says, for if these things are yours and abound, okay, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, what are those things? Let's, let's get a little, little review, okay, for five through seven. Those things are this, diligence, to be diligent, virtue, okay, um, knowledge, the knowledge of God, okay, perseverance. Now, that perseverance is this. It's being able to persevere in the midst of trial. Everyone here, the bottom line is you're going through trials. You're either going through a trial or you're coming out of a trial. Or one's right around the corner. Okay? That's the bottom line. What are you going through in these trials? How do you respond? Because trials make us stronger. They could be our friends, not our enemies. Okay? Um, the Bible says, Consider not the fire of trials that are going to come, come upon you, for it's working its eternal weight of glory. And so sometimes trials is going to make you strong and build your character and strengthen you, you know, and sometimes, you know, if you got a metal, you take that metal, and you want to make it stronger, you put it in the, the fire, and you heat it up real hot, and then you get the impurities out of it, out of it, and you scrape it off, and it becomes strong, tempered steel, and so sometimes those trials are necessary, and they're very important. God doesn't want to beat us up, but he wants us to be the person who we're to be, and sometimes we learn a lot of things in life when we go through hard times. It's the school of hard knocks, man, you know? And you learn a lot through the difficult times. And you know what? It's kind of like, so when the storms come, what's it talk about having the roots? They, they got to go way down. So when that wind comes, you're not going to blow over. Those roots are going to go way down, and you're going to be strong, you know? And, uh, and that's what we want to do. Amen. So, we'll be neither barren nor unfruitful, and the presence of these qualities makes us a healthy Christian. 
and we are going to be productive in our lives. And so, again, remember when Jesus talks about, um, in John chapter 15, about I am the vine and you are the branches? Remember that? He says, if you abide in me, you will bear what? How much fruit? Much fruit. But without me, you can't do it. So you've got to abide in that vine, don't you? And get the nutrition and the minerals and the, the spiritual strength coming from him. And, uh, and it's abiding in the vine, abiding in Christ. Here's a question I would ask all of us here tonight. A very important question is this. Does your life bring people closer to Christ? Think about that. Does your life bring you closer to Christ? Bring people closer to Christ? Are you an odious odor? Or are you a fragrance of perfume, a sweetness? That's something we need all to look at, you know? Are we bringing people closer? Or are they going further away? I hope we're bringing people closer and we're approachable, you know, because that's what Jesus was. You know, he said, you know, he, he had people come to us, uh, come to him, and he didn't just, re, you know, repel them. He went to the woman at the well, and uh, he went to the children, and he went to the person that was, you know, paralyzed, the blind person, the lepers. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come call, to call the sinners to repentance. And Jesus was out there with the people. You know, wherever there was a need, he was there. And you might think you're in a crowd of people, you're in a sea of people, and you know what? You get lost in the crowd. But Jesus knows you that where you're at in that crowd, and he points you out. And he comes, usually in that crowd, to the person with the biggest need, doesn't he? And that's how the Lord works. Merciful and gracious and kind. And people were attracted to him. Not so much with the scribes and Pharisees, were they? You know, he called them a brood of vipers, whitewashed sepulchers, dead man's bones. Because you know what they were doing? They were putting bondages on the people. And they were, they were repelling people from coming to God, and Jesus doesn't like that. He went into the temple, and he said, what did he do in the temple? He overthrew the, the money changers, right? He said, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus doesn't like religion because religion builds walls and it, brings, it builds barriers to prevent people from coming to him. And that's why Jesus, you never find a scripture ever says come to religion, Jesus says come to me. It's that relationship. It's that one-on-one -on -one relationship. But let's ask ourselves, does your life bring people closer to Christ? Very, very important. Let's continue on. Let's go ahead and read verse 9 and 10. Here we go. <clears throat> for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And so the lack of fruitfulness in believers' lives may be caused by two factors. One, blindness or forgetfulness. A short-sighted person is one who looks only at the earthly material things, does not see the spiritual things. Only concerned with his present life. Jesus said, and it was in Matthew chapter 6, uh, he said, Lay not yourself treasures here on earth, where moth and rust corrupts, where thieves break through and steal. But lay yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupts, where thieves break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your what? Your heart. And so let's not get to consume so much with this world but let's lay our treasures in heaven. That's the real bank account that's not going to perish. Your time, your treasure, your talent. We have all three of those, don't we? You can give your time, you can give your treasure, and you can give your talent. And you can send them on ahead and store them up in heaven. Amen. What shall a profit the man, Jesus said, if he gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? God puts a pretty high premium on a soul, doesn't he? I mean, you could have everything in this life and miss heaven. If you have God, you got everything. If you don't have God, you have nothing. I'll tell you a story. Um, Al and Peggy, uh, we took them out for breakfast, and uh, when they came here, remember that they, they came here and 
were telling about the China, the China trip, they were there 30 times. They shared something that really blew me away. And um, hang on a second. Got to get some water here. But they said this, uh, Al said this. He said, you know, they were on the mission field and they were amongst the lepers. And, and he said there was a lady in a plastic chair. And she had just nubs for her hands and nubs for her feet. And she raises her hands up and she says, I got Jesus, I got everything. And here she had, her body was breaking down and she had, it, it was decaying and she was in a plastic chair. I mean, think about that. I have Jesus, I have everything. I mean, is that focus or what? That is a depth of faith. I, man, that's just unbelievable. And so, if you got Jesus, you got everything. If you, have Je if you don't have Jesus, you have absolutely nothing. You know, I hear these athletes, you know, they have, they, they win. Um, I'm kind of giving my notes away for, uh, for Sunday, but, uh, well, I think I'll save it. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You have people that have everything. They look very successful, you know, and they're, they're you know, they're, they're promoted through the media, and, you know, they got the world by the tail, and they got the money, they got the cars, they got the fame, and they got everything that the flesh desires, and they're empty. And what does Solomon say? All is vanity, 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 all is vanity. He said, fear God and obey his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. And so you got Jesus, you got everything. You don't have Jesus, you have nothing. Amen. Let's continue on. Last verse here, and we'll close it up. Verse 10, here's what it says. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Wow. So, be diligent in seeking the Lord. I'm thinking about 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Write it down. And not only write it down, but live it out. And when I say that, that's for all of us here. Live it out. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in the works of the Lord. Be steadfast. Be diligent. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, yield your members to instruments of righteousness, okay? That's what we do. Now, it's not the question of falling into eternal perdition. It's not that, okay, in this, in this verse. The work of Jesus delivers us from sin if we put our faith and trust in Him, okay? And so that's what it is, to put our faith and trust in the Lord. Um, and you know what? It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his riches and grace. That's in Ephesians 1.7. So if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we have redemption, we have forgiveness of sin, and we got his grace. That's a beautiful verse. Ephesians 1 7, just meditate on that verse and bring that home and match that in your spirit. It's all about Him. It is all about Him. It's about that relationship. And you know what? I think the danger and the peril for us as Christians, I think, is to fall into spiritual idleness. I really do. It's to slumber. And uh, let's not slumber. We can't afford to slumber, guys. You know, we got to be awake. You know, I mean, things are drawing near. And, you know, I, we don't want to miss the opportunities. The window is closing. Uh, the world's not going to go on forever as it's going. It's, it's, it's going to get worse. And we can't f afford to slumber or sleep. Idleness is a devil's workshop. Let us be about our Father's business. And let's look and see for opportunities that God has for us. And you know what? There's so many opportunities throughout the day. And, uh, you know, if God opens a door, go into that door and let God use you. Look to talk to people. You know, make your faith, you know, Christianity is, is, is about people. It's about God and it's about, what is it, the two things, right? It says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, 
with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do these, you fulfill the whole commandment of God. So people say, what's the will of God? There it is, right there. When you go knocking on doors and share, when you share the faith, people say, what's your motive? What are you, what are you out here for? What are you doing? And you know, I've said many times, I said, well, we're here to love God and love people. And how can you argue with that? That's a great thing because it's true. We want to love God and love people. Oh, okay. Can we pray for you? Well, okay. Then we pray. And so there's a lot of opportunities for the kingdom of God. So I'm going to close with this last comment. And I, repeat, I said it a couple times, and I'm going to end with this comment. And here it is. Does your life bring people closer to Christ? And that's something to ponder. Amen? That's something to ponder. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We, we, uh, broke, we uh, read your word. We opened it up, and it's a, it's a fragrance. Help us to be a fragrance of sweetness, not an odious odor. I pray, Lord, that as we do these things, the, the things that you give, the diligence and the knowledge and the virtue and all these great things, that kindness and the love that, Lord, you pour into us, that we can walk in the Spirit not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we can't do this on our own. We need your power, and we, did, we need the power of your Spirit walking in and through us. Fill us with your Spirit today and help us to walk in your Spirit. I pray for everyone here today that, that you would have a special assignment for each and every one of us, that you would use our life as a vessel here I am, Lord, send me, that, we, that you would send us to people that are hurting, people that are lost, and people that need just love in their lives. And so, Lord, fill us. We can't give out what we don't put in. Help us to spend time in that sanctuary, that secret place of the Most High, and you are the shadow of the Almighty. And so we love you today, and we ask that you just work in and through us, and bless everyone here, get, them a good, get us all a good night's sleep. Bless us with good health. And Lord, we just love you and thank you for all that we have and all that you've given us. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Come up for prayer.